I invite our beloved university librarian to welcome the gathering. Kalai vanakkam. You know, there are some situations are there. If, if one person occupies a position, then the person will get a name, like Pondicherry. If there in Pondicherry uh, city, one mayor will be there. Suppose, the, uh, I'm telling uh, theoretically, one person is there, Anand. When Anand becomes the mayor of the uh, uh, Pondicherry things, then Anand will get the name by name. He will become popular, isn't it? The Anand will become popular because he is the mayor. Now, you can consider in other direction, vice versa. If Anand become the mayor, then mayor position will enhance. Isn't it? Here, Anand will, he will not become the answer. The position mayor itself enhanced like this. Uh, when, as and when our uh, professor Clement is the Lord Sir, he joined as a direct, director, culture and culture of relation Pondicherry University. From that day onwards, the you know the 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 wings of the director has been colourful. It's flied high like this. So, sir, all with your all your busy schedule, I know you shown your uh, presence uh, to uh, to distribute the. Uh, prizes that are won by our uh, students and also affiliated colleges and also uh, nowadays uh, we have more or less we, we, hello, sir. more or less we are forgotten the flavor of Shakespeare in the campus because since beginning uh, this is uh, this is my third year I did not saw any single events on William Shakespeare maybe a talk on William Shakespeare or on his, uh, on his uh, uh, literature. So, in this regard, to revive the literature of the William Shakespeare, what we requested our director, culture and cultural sir, to revive the literature of William Shakespeare, we need your valuable presence as a, a talk. In this regard, with your busy schedule, he accepted our proposal. Thanks, sir. So, uh, thanks for your kind acceptance and showing your the presence here. And also, for for this function, I so heartedly welcome in behalf of all our Pondicherry University committee. So, we welcome you. Yeah. Yes. I welcome our the dean, CDC Pondicherry University Professor Chandrasekhar Rao. Uh, Professor Jay Kumar, the head of the department, the computer science, assistant registrar, Mr. Pushkar from uh, CDC, uh, Professor Jay Shankar Babu from Hindi department, father from Asian studies, and I welcome all our senior library officers like Dr. Bhaskar, Dr. Vijay Kumar and other team. I welcome all the security and vigilance wing. I welcome all the charming faces of students from Pondicherry University and affiliated colleges. I welcome all, if I forget the names, sorry, I welcome all audience for this function. I welcome you once again all. Now we can inaugurate our function. I inv uh, invite uh, Professor Clement sir and uh, librarian sir along with other officials for the inauguration. our beloved Professor Clement sir for a special lecture on why do I love Shakespeare. Our university librarian Dr. Jay Kumar, Professor Chandrasekhar Rao, 
our Russian three star Pushkar, Professor Jay Sankar Babu, Father Jonas, Professor Jay Kumar from Computer Science Department, <coughs> and all the staff from the library, and also I could see people from outside and uh, the invited guests, scholars and students. It is my privilege to be here on this particular occasion to give a small lecture on why do I love Shakespeare. This is not going to be an elaborate discussion of uh, Shakespeare or his works. And moreover, it is humanly impossible to talk about such a great poet and a dramatist in a couple of hours. But I have taken a few interesting points and my emphasis would be on them in order to illustrate why I have a fascination for Shakespeare. And when you look at the question, why do I love Shakespeare? I need not answer any, you know, uh, point. Why? Because if you don't like a person, if you hate a person, then you may be having reasons for that. People would immediately ask you, why do you hate that person? Unless you have some points with you, then probably people will not accept that you are hating the person for no apparent reason. But to love a person, there need not be any reason. And the people will not question you, why do you love that person? Yes, I love that person, that's all. That itself will become the answer. But I love Shakespeare. In the beginning itself, let me tell you, my fascination for Shakespeare started as early as my college days. I was doing my BA. At that time, since I am an artist and most of you know that I am an artist and you must have seen my portraits also. And uh, several of these portraits are there in every nook and corner of our Pondicherry University and uh, you would not have missed them. I started drawing a portrait of Shakespeare on the wall of my room just a day before my examination on Shakespeare. Probably you may wonder is this a good thing to do before the examination? Because I already prepared enough for the examination and therefore in order to while away the time, there is nothing to prepare or there is nothing to browse it. Therefore, I started making a picture on the wall with the help of a pencil. But whether this pencil would result in a good portrait of Shakespeare, that too on a rough surface, that was a big surprise to me and it has come out well. And after that, I took a photograph of that picture and I was keeping it for some time because my father went on telling everyone that my son has drawn a picture on the wall and this is Shakespeare. And the people started coming to my house for that purpose of seeing the picture. And therefore, I thought that suppose if I am not there, if my room is closed, they should get a glimpse of the picture and the best way of presenting it is through a photograph. And after that, I somewhere or other got a booklet written by the director of Shakespeare Birthplace Trust, Dr. Levy Fox, a highly influential person during the last part of the 20th century. And he himself may not be knowing how many books that he wrote on Shakespeare. Such a great scholar. Only one small book I got. I saw the address. Then immediately it dawned to me that why don't we write a letter to him with the picture as the enclosure. And the letter reached him, but he was silent for some time. And I never thought I will get any acknowledgement from such a great person like Dr. Levy Fox. But after a month or so, not only a letter of acknowledgement came, along with that five or six books he authored. Very great books they are all. And in fact, 
my interest in shakespeare started at that time i started reading all the books sent by him to me and i browsed through the books and i understood who shakespeare is really and after that my interest in shakespeare redoubled that is my first acquaintance with the shakespeare now the first slide as you can see this is the only thing available with the shakespeare signature and all the other things that he wrote which he kept in a tin box in his very famous theater called globe theater owned by him they were completely lost during a fire accident that has taken place in england at the time in the globe theater unfortunately we are not able to get even one trace of shakespeare's handwriting except this signature the first reason that i love shakespeare because his entire life is a clouded one mysterious we may not be able to say that this is shakespeare and this is his family and these are all the things that he touched these are all the things that are still kept in the museum you can't say because we are left almost to nothing and whether a man called shakespeare existed at the start of the 15th century itself is a big question mark and now we are left with this small signature and in that signature you can see that there will be a little shaking in his handwriting this is the signature that he put on the will wheel when he wrote he just put his signature and now a very big research is going on in order to know who the man behind the signature is whether he is a, a polite man or whether he is a ruffian whether he is having any kind of nervous tension or he is any good being healthy man as ourselves a big research is going on and moreover the interest in shakespeare i need not tell you for every 15 minutes there is one thesis submitted in one part of the globe on one of his plays hamlet just remember every 15 minutes there is one thesis phd thesis submitted on one of his plays hamlet alone then you can understand how great the author is that itself gives credit and moreover when a life of a man is mysterious and we are not able to get anything out of that that itself gives you some kind of awe a w e that means some kind of respect if everything is known about a saint we don't love him if everything is known about god why should we go and worship him you are indulging in praying to god in sanskrit slogans that you like perhaps if everything is in tamil or in your own native tongue you may not like it because you love to recite a poem which is not of your mother tongue that itself gives you some kind of influence you think that it is more inspiring the sanskrit slogans that we utter during the prayer time in the temple and you don't want to get it translated into any other language better be the slogans in sanskrit whether we know it or not that is a different thing therefore when a person's life is totally clouded we do not know anything about it that itself is a kind of a mystery that you want to explore and that is what i have been doing and that is one thing that i liked in the life of shakespeare total blankness and out of which you have to call out one by one through the internal evidences only because you are left with no external evidence at all that slide number 2 i love shakespeare because he has enriched our english vocabulary he contributed 12000 words 
twelve thousand words. Just imagine, these are all the coinages of Shakespeare. Before that, we have no such words in the vocabulary, but Shakespeare started introducing one by one. What are these words? When you are keeping quiet, when I ask you a question, you are not able to answer it, but you are just keeping quiet, and I tell you, are you tongue-tied? See the word he uses. Are you tongue-tied? If you use that word tongue-tied, then remember Shakespeare. You are introducing a person who is not at all sympathetic with the fellow human beings. You describe him as he is the one who has no milk of human kindness. Where did this phrase come from? Shakespeare. Milk of human kindness. How beautifully he demonstrates it. Because it is the milk of human kindness that is more important than anything else. And when you use the phrase, love is blind. Because Shakespeare always used to say, the young people's love, they are not in their heart, but in their eyes. And if you have love in your eyes, it will subject to change. If you happen to see the opposite sex, a better looking person, then naturally your love would also change. That is why he said that love is blind. And when you say something vanished into thin air, vanishing into thin air, because just now I saw something, but now I am not seeing it. What happened to it? I think it must have vanished into thin air. Then again you are quoting Shakespeare only. And moreover, <coughs> the word that he has introduced to enrich your vocabulary, Sir, the next one. <coughs> yes, the green-eyed monster, that is one word, because green-eyed monster is nothing but the jealousy we have for the other people. The suspicion that we have other people, he calls it as a green-eyed monster that would simply, you know, kill you in the long run. And the longest word in English is also the one that comes from Shakespeare. Love's labor lost, that is the play. Sometimes in the general knowledge paper, they will ask you, who has introduced the longest word in English? The credit goes only to Shakespeare. Honorofica, Billy Tedious, then Nitadibus. Honorofica, Billy Tedious, Nitadibus. One word which has all the letters you find in the English alphabet put together. <coughs> what is the meaning of this word? The state of receiving an honor, that's all. The state of receiving an honor because Shakespeare himself has explained it a little. Otherwise, we may not be knowing what actually it means. Such a difficult word, isn't it? <coughs> and uh, the, the poets or the writers who are afraid of using big and lengthy words like this, they are suffering from a particular phobia. What is that phobia called? <coughs> Hippobothamus, Hippobothamus, Billypedious phobia. That means you don't want to use any big word and you always go for small words and silly expressions. But Shakespeare is not afraid of that. He is not suffering from that particular phobia. That is why he has started introducing this particular word which has become the longest word. And in fact, the first dictionary came out somewhere in the year 1716 by the great lexicographer called Dr. Johnson. He was the one who compiled our English dictionary. And at that time, he mostly used the words taken from the complete works of Shakespeare. Where to go for vocabulary? Where to go for words? He himself says that, I went to the complete works of Shakespeare and I have taken out liberally the words introduced by Shakespeare. And in fact, the English dictionary 
when you go into the beginning you find hardly it comprises of more than 4000 words that's all but now you have volumes of you know books for one particular letter a alone you have 12 volumes b alone you have 15 volumes c alone you have 20 volumes like that oxford english dictionary but if shakespeare has not contributed so much to enrich our english language then we would not have got so many words in english and therefore the love that we show for the language then it takes in the form of love that we show for Shakespeare himself. So, for this reason that he must be praised. Now, let us go to slide number three. <coughs> the universality of Shakespeare, the versatility of Shakespeare. Shakespeare is the man of the world. How do you know that? And you all know, at least to some extent, he was born and brought up in Stratford upon Avon. That is the place where he was born. It is a small village at that time. Now we are calling it as the Shakespeare's city. Adjoining to the place where he was born, they have constructed a very huge building called the Shakespeare Center. I have 30 years of association with this Shakespeare Center. <coughs> And if you enter into the Shakespeare Center, even before you enter, you just look at the bust of Shakespeare in one corner. So, you may be very much, you know, taken aback by the beauty of that bust. Then, something will tell you that there is one more bust at your back. What is that? You simply turn round and you will see. I am talking about the place where he was born, the Shakespeare Center. Even before you get into it, you see the bust of Shakespeare and something would tell you there is another bust that you missed. This is at the back of this particular statue. You look at it. Whose statue it was? Whose statues you find there? You may think about the numerous Shakespeare's characters or you may think about the Greek authors, Socrates, because he must be ranked with the great philosophers Plato. No! Our Rabindranath Tagore and underneath the bust you find a poem which he wrote in honour of Shakespeare. They have given such importance to Rabindranath Tagore and we must be all proud of this particular thing. On one side you have Shakespeare's bust, then looking at this bust is another bust of our own immortal poet Rabindranath Tagore and he wrote a poem in honour of Shakespeare and that has been inscribed under the bust. Okay, then you get inside the centre where you see a big globe rotating. It goes on rotating, rotating. Then there is something written there and you like to read it. What is that? <coughs> Shakespeare, come on, the man of the world. Shakespeare, the man of the world. You may ask me one question, sir, how can you call him as the man of the world because he is a Britisher, <coughs> right? Typically he is a Britisher. Then how can you call him man of the world? My dear friends, if he is only just a Britisher, always clinging to his own nation, always ranked as the greatest patriot, he would not have touched upon the other countries. But you need not read the complete works of Shakespeare, you read the titles of his plays, you will understand that Shakespeare is not only concerned with England, but he is equally concerned with the other countries. <coughs> Take for example, Othello. Okay, who is Othello? The subtitle says, he is the moor of Venice. Take Romeo and Juliet. Romeo and Juliet 
they are the Romans. You take Antony and Cleopatra. Who is Cleopatra? The Egyptian pharaoh. Then you take Pericles, the title I am telling. Then there is a subtitle, the Prince of Tyre. Othello, the Moor of Venice. Two gentlemen of Verona, that is the title. So from here you can understand Shakespeare has not restricted himself to one particular country, one particular habit, one particular fashion. Had he restricted that, you will not be reading Shakespeare as you are reading now as the man of the world. He never had this kind of selfishness. He wanted to explore many countries and bring in all those things that information he has gathered about that particular country and incorporated them in his work. My dear friends, you may not be knowing in one particular play, Henry the Sixth Part Three, there is a particular scene where the English prince and the French princess are courting each other. The conversation is given both in French and English. In beautiful French, Shakespeare has written for the princesses of France. English I need not tell you, because that he can <laughs> make of his own. But where did he get this uh, knowledge in French? Because we are not told that he has learned French. In spite of that, the entire conversation is in French and English, French and English like that. The French princess is talking in French and the English prince is replying in English. That shows Shakespeare is not a man of one particular country or one particular region, but he is simply the man of the world. And that is where the universality of Shakespeare comes. Not only that, I can give one example. We are saying Shakespeare in this world. Okay, but let me give you an example. If you look at the sky from today, you will be remembering Shakespeare. Why? Because, as you all know, every planet has some moons. Uranus is the planet which has got more number of moons. Not one, but how many? Twenty moons. Uranus planet alone got twenty moons. And if you look at the sky, probably you will be able to remember Shakespeare now because most of these moons are named after the character of Shakespeare. One moon is called Ariel, another moon is called Puck, and the third moon, okay, is called, you know, uh, by some other character, mostly taken from Midsummer Night's Dream. Therefore, the popularity of Shakespeare, you can imagine, even the moons in the planet Uranus are named after him means that accounts of his popularity. We need not tell you how popular Shakespeare has become. Even the moons in the Uranus are named after Shakespeare. That accounts is, you know, enduring popularity. <laughs> then, <coughs> the, yes, this is what I told you. Timon of Athens, Pericles, the prince of Tyre, that is the name of one particular country. Othello, the mover of Venice, Venice is another country. Antony and Cleopatra, we find Cleopatra to be the Egyptian pharaoh. So, never restricted himself to one country. And the, the Uranus, I told you, the moons are named after these characters you find in Shakespeare, Puck, Ariel, Titania, Caliban, to name a few. <coughs> yes, the next one. Yes, this is where we are now coming to. I love Shakespeare because he happens to be the greatest philosopher of our time. What kind of philosopher? A philosopher who can simplify philosophy. A philosopher you who has the capacity to bring down philosophy from the skies to dwell among ordinary human beings. 
he is not talking in the way of socrates or he is not a philosopher to the size of plato he is not talking about just like aristotle or any other philosopher but he dilutes everything to the fullest level and in a very crystal clear way he makes you understand what our life is take for example in one particular scene in hamlet this is supposed to be the grave diggers scene two buffoons clowns are digging the grave and in the conversation you find shakespeare introducing philosophy in a distilled manner one person is asking the other one who is the king the other person answers a thing of nothing that's all a thing of nothing that is what you call as king and let us not simply imagine king to be like that because the answer comes next why do we fatten the cattle because you know in foreign countries that they are all meat eaters and therefore why are you fattening the cattle one grave digger is asking the other person says to fatten ourselves then very reasonable question the other person is asking why do we fatten ourselves he answers to fatten the worms to fatten the worms why because when you die as a very big fat man worms will be very happy because they can eat your body for days together that is why we are fatten ourselves <laughs> a lean person may not be preferred by the worms because he is going to be food to them for a week or so this is our life we are fattening the cattle to fatten ourselves and we are fattening ourselves to fatten the worms is it not then at one point <coughs> macbeth such a great man who is totally destroyed because of his ambition indulges in a soliloquy soliloquy means what a person who is talking to himself sometimes we do that with the nuts when you are not having any other companion and there you see the philosophy of shakespeare coming to the brink tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps into this petty pace from day to day all our rested days are lighted fools the way to dusty death out out to brief candle life is a player that struts and frets upon the stage and is heard no more it is a tale told by an idiot full of sound and noise and ending in nothing that's all so it is a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury signifying nothing that nothing is the word that he likes the best that itself shows how philosophical he has become and all the philosophers and the people who are uh, making you to meditate they only tell you that to meditate on nothing but shakespeare already got it and the word nothing has fascinated him if somebody asks you what is the favorite word of shakespeare without hesitation you can say nothing he plays on this word because in um, king lear lear is asking how much you love me the first daughter comes and says that i love you so much this thing that thing hyperbolic expressions the second daughter also comes and exaggerates even more but the third daughter cordelia comes and says how much you love me nothing then lear asks nothing again cordelia says nothing nothing will come out of nothing cordelia mend your speech a little or you may mar your fortune come on repeat father i love you as a daughter loves the father nothing more nothing less whether you are giving me a big property as my share or not i don't bother about that i love you as i love a father after that i will love my husband part of this will go there that's all that is life you should accept that immediately cardelia is sent out of the kingdom and several things happened but whenever there is a an excuse 
for introducing the word nothing he will do that and dr johnson says this is one of the weaknesses of shakespeare one of the weaknesses repeating a particular word again and again in order to give certain emphasis for example in one particular play he goes to the extent of using this word sometimes it irritated seven a little annoying will be there but he cannot avoid that because it has become his obsession there the king suspects his wife and the minister comes and says why do you suspect your wife i have seen her in that particular place with that man again i have seen them eating in another place again i have seen them indulging in gossips etc but the minister says only one thing sir these are all nothing immediately the king gets angry see the use of shakespeare's vocabulary and the expressions if this is nothing the world and all the things in it are nothing covering sky is nothing bohemia is nothing my wife is nothing nor nothing of this nothing if this be nothing nobody can write like this with such forceful expressions nor nothing of this nothings if this be nothing to that extent he gives emphasis to it and whenever i tell this in the class with my students then immediately they would say sir shakespeare is the number one writer incomparable and there is no other writer in any language who has touched this particular glory i used to tell my dear friends wait don't come to that conclusion because there is one great poet in tamil he wrote a poem almost similar to that of this one taking a very small simple story what is that story the king goes for hunting there he comes across a tiger with the help of the spear that he is having over his shoulder he kills the tiger comes back to the palace where he is welcomed by all the maids with alati is it not we used to call that alati this is the story how beautifully the story is told by the tamil poet maramadu marathil eri maramadai tholil vaithu maramadu marathai kandru marathinal marathai kutti maramadu valiye sendru maram manai kegum bodu maramadu kanda maadar maramodu maram eduthar i used to ask them don't you find the same kind of flavor don't you find the same kind of what do you call the spirit in this poem as well repeating the words that is the usual thing that a poet will do patruga patratron patrinai a patrai patruga patru vidarku that is what valur says is not the repetition will be there but that that is one way of emphasizing certain thing with the beauty of a particular word okay <clears throat> in hamlet he takes a very important question whether we can continue to live in this world or put an end to it by committing suicide and hamlet says yes we can commit suicide but we do not know what will happen thereafter because it is a one way world we can only go to the other world but nobody who went there came back and told us what they have seen that's all one way traffic you can go to heaven or you cannot expect any person to come back and tell you what they have seen otherwise immediately we can put an end to our life why because it is better not to lead a life of this kind with full of sorrows every day as thomas arde that very famous poet said happiness is but an occasional episode in the daily drama of pain happiness is but an occasional episode in the daily drama of pain this life itself is a drama of pain happiness is but an occasional episode that will come and touch you upon that's all it will never happen always is it not that is what thomas arde also said 
therefore we can put an end to our life but unfortunately something prevents us from doing it what is that this is the point nobody has told anything about what they have seen or what is there in the other world otherwise we can commit suicide highly philosophical then macbeth is able general he has committed several sins because of his ambition at last he is bedridden the wife comes and immediately calls a doctor but macbeth knows he is not suffering from any physical problem but his problems are confined mentally how that has to be treated physical problem means i can treat you but mental problem means difficult but the wife lady macbeth calls a doctor to attend on macbeth the doctor comes and then asks her what can i do for you how philosophical are the words of macbeth can't thou not minister to a mind diseased pluck from the memory a rooted sorrow rates out the written troubles of the brain and with some sweet oblivious antidote clean the stuffed bottom of that perilous stuff which weighs upon the heart can you do that doctor can't thou not minister to a mind diseased my body is not diseased my mind diseased do you have any cure for that <coughs> pluck from the memory a rooted sorrow my sorrow is deep rooted can you pluck it out my troubles are written on my mind do you have any rubber to erase it out and with a sweet oblivious antidote cleans the stuffed bottom of that perilous stuff which weighs upon the heart immediately the, the doctor says wherein the patient should minister to himself i can't do anything you should become a doctor yourself then only you can cure your disease you can't call upon a doctor and doctor will be of no use to you then immediately macbeth says throw your physic to dark sam none of it get away from this place why are you coming and bothering me if you have some kind of ailments for these diseases that i told you attend on me otherwise get out that is what you call philosophy and in tempest how beautifully he has summarized the life we are such stuff as dreams are made on and our little life is rounded with a sleep <clears throat> we are such stuff our body you think that it is made of steel nothing will happen to you that is what you are thinking but shakespeare says we are such stuff as dreams are made on how our dreams are do you think that the dreams have got any stuff any material nothing we are such stuff as dreams are made on and our little life that means our small life is rounded with a sleep always it is rounded with a sleep means always it is surrounded by death that's all you can't escape that shakespeare <coughs> is a master writer as far as the blank verse is concerned all the 38 plays he wrote with a particular meter called blank verse blank verse you can write a poem blank verse you can write an epic but you can't write a drama out of blank verse because it is a very difficult meter and using this blank verse meter he has written 38 plays and again there is a controversy whether he wrote 37 or 38 in my opinion he wrote 38 plays but uh, all other people say that he wrote only 37 because one play has become a controversial play whether he wrote it or whether he wrote with the collaboration of somebody or whether somebody wrote it in the name of shakespeare or whether the simply the play is attributed to shakespeare we do not know whatever it is let me tell you one small example in order to illustrate how he is using blank verse in the plays let me take a very familiar example from J- romeo and juliet romeo and juliet they got married secretly under the auspicious presence of one friar lawrence he is the one who has married them secretly why secretly because the two families are 
at daggers drawn at each other. The two families are fighting with each other. Therefore, this type of marriages cannot be arranged in the church. However, he can solemnize the marriage in his cell. He has done it. Nobody knows. But Friar Lawrence thinks that at the right time, he can disclose the secret to others that they got married. But so far it didn't happen. Unfortunately, what happens in the family of Juliet, they are seeking a new groom for Juliet. A new groom, Pudu Mapla. And immediately, Juliet becomes very, very agitated. How come? Because they do not know that she got married. Therefore, they have selected a boy who is good enough for Juliet. And immediately, Juliet, after hearing this, rushes to Friar Lawrence. Why? To argue with him. Father, you only got us married. Now, in my family, they are telling that I should get married once again. How come? Stop it. When she goes there, Friar Lawrence is there. But uh, again, unfortunately, the one who is going to get married to Juliet, his name is Paris. He also comes. Why? To select the date of the marriage. Right? He also comes. The moment he enters, Juliet is in a very, very sober mood, controls her emotion and tears are coming out. She takes a handkerchief and wipes off her face. Friar Lawrence is also standing there. The moment Paris enters, calls Juliet, well met my lady and my wife. See the language. She has not become his wife, but she, he calls her as his wife. Well met my lady and my wife. Immediately Juliet answered that maybe when I may be your wife. Then immediately Paris answers that maybe must be Wednesday next. Wednesday next, after all, we are going to get married. Why do you bother? <laughs> then immediately the father says silently, what will be, shall be, that is a certain text. You see the language. How beautifully he puts it, rhyming. Well met my lady and my wife. That may be when I may be your wife. That may be, must be, Wednesday next. What will be, shall be, that is a certain text. This is what you call blank verse. And the person who has made use of this blank verse in such a wonderful manner is Shakespeare alone. I have read all the contemporary plays of Shakespeare. Nothing has interested me, nothing has fascinated me as I am captivated by the works of Shakespeare. This is the one that I wanted to tell you. My love again goes to Shakespeare because of this. The next one, sir. Yes, I love Shakespeare because many of you may not be knowing that he made several references to India. Not only once, but more than 16 times you find Shakespeare making references to India. And sometimes the scholars used to ask me, Sir, Shakespeare making references to India, unbelievable, sir. Yes, that is what you may be thinking. But he made references to India. And you will ask me out of your anxiety, you would like to ask me only one question now. We are not going to the references, but you would ask me, sir, whether Shakespeare praises India. So that in your next talk, you will be making use of it. In your next essay, you will be making use of it. Shakespeare likes India. And India is being glorified by Shakespeare. If I tell a politician that there will be banners for Shakespeare tomorrow itself, because as if he is the first man to find out that Shakespeare has spoken about India. My dear friends, I am very sorry to say, Shakespeare did not say anything good about India. <coughs> what he said about India, India is a glorious country of riches. It is a spectacular country of luxury. It is a country full of wealth. 
but unfortunately it has been crowded with lunatic people who will not understand anything barbarians they are all to that extent he has branded us it is quite unfortunate you may ask me what may be the reason before going to the reason let me tell you one example you are all familiar with the story of othello othello kills his wife destimona why because of his suspicion and at last it is proved that there is nothing wrong with his wife a very prudent woman but he only suspected and that has gone to the death that means he has killed her and <sighs> this man is standing outside and he is fully happy that he has killed her because if she is not killed she will go on tempting other men she has betrayed him and she is going to betray more men therefore she must be killed with that intention only he goes kills her comes back as if nothing has happened as a general he has punished an unprudent lady that's all but after that things turn a different direction evidences come and it shows clearly that desdemona has not done anything wrong but unfortunately this fellow has killed her and there is a trial scene he is brought to the court and the duke is asking what have you done desdemona everyone knows that she is a very good woman but you have killed her why how it happened sir i want to tell you one thing othello says a beautiful pearl has been given to an indian fisherman and that indian fisherman when he got it without knowing the worth of that pearl has simply thrown it into the sea because a fisherman who has intelligence will immediately know the price of that pearl but without knowing the price of the pearl things that eh, after all what is this something he has thrown it away so far good but why indian fisherman <coughs> he could have said australian <laughs> fisherman or the british fisherman we would have been happy but just like the indian fisherman who after getting this pearl without knowing his worth throws it away i got that precious pearl desdemona without knowing her worth i have killed her so even at that time he gives a negative meaning to the content therefore that clearly shows that he hasn't got anything good to say about india friends all this thing happened because never once he visited india not only that shakespeare never visited any other foreign country he was always locked up in great britain there he was born there he died but what about these information that he gathered about india as i told you a very magnificent country full of gems full of riches etc only from the travelers all the travelers because shakespeare lived during the time of travel the travelers who have come to india they offered him all the materials for writing they have described india only in this way it is a fabulous country of riches it is a fabulous country of gems diamonds and what not and therefore he is making rich use of what he gathered the information that he collected rather than cross examining it with others you know friends aristotle the very famous philosopher committed a very great mistake <coughs> and this mistake was pointed out by russell <coughs> what was that mistake in one of his writings he said women have fewer teeth than men <coughs> women have fewer teeth than men is it true are you having less number of teeth than men no but he has done it thinking that what he has written is the right one 
but rasul says after all he is a married man <coughs> he would have asked his wife to open her mouth counted the teeth literally the truth would have come out he would not have committed this uh, uh, flaw but he has done it because of not cross examining it with others shakespeare did the same thing <coughs> for example when a particular uh, uh, incident is mentioned the second one that uh, antonio in merchant of venice lost all his ships basanio is asking sir all the ships you mean not one hit not one hit means not one hit the mark that means not only one escaped from lebson barbary and india see india is mentioned that means the merchant of venice had links with india also so all the ships were destroyed how come you are not having ship in one particular country you are having ships all over the world but ultimately how all the ships were destroyed tell me not even one escaped the one that you have in uh, lebson barbary india not even one escaped that is what he is asking and uh, the last one from all swell the dens will shakespeare describes us as sun worshippers and according to him sun worshipping will not provide you any kind of uh, stress relief but uh, in india we are all sun worshippers and at one particular point somebody is telling something to a i brand lady and he describes this particular scene he is a poor man and he is making love with a very rich and aristocratic woman the scene is described like this as if an indian sun worshipper is making his prayers to the sun but the sun is totally indifferent to him and even fail to look on the devotee what the sun will do it is a part of nature you only go and worship it the sun will not give you any kind of uh, remedy for all your problems can it that is what to shakespeare is asking at the time he makes a mention of india the sun worshipers of india they are worshiping the sun as if the sun will do everything to them but the sun will show only indifference and will not do anything to indians even though indians worship the sun <laughs> okay so the next one this is uh, i have simply put it how shakespeare depicts certain characters and uh, the notable characters that i enjoyed are the villainous characters produced by shakespeare in the case of richard iii and othello in othello iago is one character who has destroyed and who has ruined the happiness of othello even though he is very close to him and in shakespeare's plays many times you come across characters who are very close to the hero but at the same time they are the driving force they are the people who ultimately put an end to the hero's death and iago is one such villain and richard iii is a criminal monarch and richard iii is depicted as a deformed man that means he is only 4 feet in height and has hunch back in spite of that he comes to power with all the shortcomings limitations he comes to power and in the beginning how shakespeare puts it that what he is going to do thereafter very beautiful words they are all since hell heaven has made my body crooked let hell make my mind crooked to answer it see the language since heaven made my body crooked let hell make my mind crooked to answer it in that way shakespeare's introduction of the villains or the way in which he is dealing with the villains you have no parallel at all in literature because he has got that kind of a master mind to depict the villainy of a person 
to the greatest height. You will never imagine that a villain would exist in the world of this kind. Moreover, Shakespeare's villain will die without any remorse. And in fact, one of the villain who is about to be killed by the Duke is asking, are you not ashamed of your deeds? Immediately the villain says, hey, that I have not done thousand more. Yes, I am ashamed. Why? I have not done thousand more such deeds. There I am ashamed, but not ashamed of the deeds of what you are listing out, for which you are going to give me punishment. No. My regret is that I could have done thousand, <laughs> you know, more such deeds. Okay. So, this is also one thing that you should look upon. Shakespeare, an approachable writer. Why he is, uh, I called him an approachable writer because usually even though you find that there are kings, there are some supernatural characters in his place, the way in which he taught us the human follies, sometimes it makes us to wonder whether we have these limitations within us. For example, Macbeth, such a great person, general, he is destroyed because of his ambition. He is destroyed because of listening to the supernatural powers. He never relied on his own strength, but rather he relied on some supernatural powers that has ultimately brought his ruin. Lear, because of his rashness, because he has no mental balance, ability to sort out things. Hamlet, delay. Oscar Wilde once said, I will never do anything tomorrow if I can do that day after tomorrow. Usually the say is, I will do, I will never do anything tomorrow if I can do it today. Isn't that? That should be the proper thing. But he said, I will never do anything tomorrow if I can do the same thing day after tomorrow. That is the wit of Oscar Wilde. Just like that, this man went on delaying and it has ultimately brought his ruin. Othello, as I already told you, it is all because of jealousy. Coming to the last point, I have given it as praises and abuses. <coughs> Hazlitt, a very great lover of Shakespeare, once remarked, Shakespeare's characters are like watches, where the dial plate is made of transparent crystal. They will show you the time, just like any other watch, but the inner mechanism can be also seen. That makes the difference. Shakespeare's characters are like watches, where the dial plays it made of transparent crystal. They will show you the time just like any other watch, but the inner mechanism can be also seen. And one of the haters of Shakespeare is none other than Bernard Shaw himself. Bernard Shaw is a humorist. You all know that. But Bernard Shaw did not like the Shakespeare because he thought that the stage is a classroom and the characters are teachers. The audience are the students. That means every play should teach you some moral. But unfortunately, Shakespeare's plays will not teach any kind of moral. And in fact, in many plays, there is a tragic waste. What do you mean by tragic waste? Instead of killing one villain, Shakespeare will finish off everyone. So, lot of dead bodies you find on the stage. Not only the hero, but hero's lover, hero's friend, and the hero's acquaintances. And all ruthless killing will be there in the place of Shakespeare that gives you some kind of, uh, what you call, discomfort. Why? Because whether I will also succeed in my life or not, because Shakespeare brings everyone down. Justice is done, but at the cost of precious lives. This is what you call tragic waste. And this has been questioned by Dr. Johnson. Why this man unnecessarily kills so many people? One or two is okay, but everyone is killed. In Hamlet, everyone is killed except Horatio. And Horatio also about to kill himself, 
Hamlet stops because he is going to die and says that at least one should be here to tell my story. For that sake, please <laughs> avoid killing. Is it not? Therefore, <coughs> Shakespeare teaches us the human follies. According to him, every one of us has one particular tragic flaw that will ultimately lead to our downfall. Try to find out what it is and get itself remedied. If you do away with your tragic flaw that you have with you, life will be alright. Otherwise, the flaw that you have will ultimately send you to the early grave. And because of this, I love Shakespeare and Bernard Shah, as I have told you, in Shakespeare's place, Bernard Shah thought that this is the one thing that you find missing. That is, there is no morality. He is not converting the stage into a classroom. He is not considering the audience as the students. He is not making the actors as teachers. The result is, he is giving us something to entertain, something to enjoy. That's all. And that is not an end in itself. Our life is not an end in itself. But every drama should try to give us some kind of moral principles. If it is not there, then you cannot call it as a drama. But Shakespeare plays are mostly for the kings, queens and all that and therefore he did not like them. But unfortunately, when Shakespeare's anniversary was celebrated at Stratford upon Avon, Bernard Shaw was called to be the chief guest. And Bernard Shaw went there without knowing why these people are calling me. But the intention is different. They wanted to call him in order to teach him a lesson. What is that? Bernard Shaw is a man of humor. He will go on cracking jokes one after the other. What they decided? To keep silent and not to respond to any of his jokes. That is what they thought. In that way, he will be taught a lesson. Bernard Shaw came as usual, started cracking jokes. But people did not laugh, smile. They did not uh, even look at him. They were minding their own work. And this has given indication that his lecture was a flop. But Bernard Shah did not give or lose hope. He went on talking. After that, he said only one thing. My dear friends, I could see that you did not like my lecture. Nor you enjoyed my jokes. But one thing I want to make sure, all the jokes that I told you today, are taken from the complete works of Shakespeare only. Therefore, by humiliating me, you have humiliated your great author Shakespeare. That is what he said and came back to his seat. My dear friends, many of you must not have read Shakespeare. The easiest way to learn Shakespeare, let me tell you, you buy the book through Flapcott. Don't go for the complete works of Shakespeare because you may not find it interesting. You may not be able to understand what it is. But there is one series of uh, books called No Fear Shakespeare. That is the title of that book. No Fear Shakespeare. You can go for any title you like. Get the book. On one side, you find the language of Shakespeare written in the original way. The other side, it is a translation of the original text. That means English to English. Old English to modern English so that you will be able to master the place of Shakespeare very easily or get to know at least the meaning. <coughs> Therefore, I think that if you get that, now all the plays are available under the title No Fear Shakespeare. If you get the books and start reading them, Shakespeare would become your companion forever. The only difference is, if you read Shakespeare now, it will give you one meaning. If you read Shakespeare after another five or six years, a different kind of interpretation you yourself will be able to make it. Therefore, he is not a person where you can be satisfied with your guess interpretation or your guess meaning. But it will go on changing your mentality. He, he, he will sit upon you and he will condition your mind and he will help you out. Don't ask me whether he is here or not. He is here only, in my opinion, because 
if you approach him in that way you will be able to get uh, the glimpse of shakespeare or what we now call as the spirit of shakespeare it will influence you as it has influenced you know millions of people all over the world thank you so much thank you sir uh, we are very thankful to you for your wonderful oral narration on shakespeare and his literary contributions now let us move towards our main agenda of this event uh, distributing prizes and uh, certificates to the participants more than 50 members of, of students from various departments from pondicherry university as well as affiliated colleges were participants in the event uh, we had uh, conducted uh, uh, co uh, competitions on four heads like essay competition poetry writing and uh, art competition as well as quiz now we will call upon the prize winners